Ruiz. Welcome back to the next part of this Truth and Rhythm episode. Be sure to subscribe to this channel. If you've already done so, please share it with friends. Also become a member by joining Truth and Rhythm on Patreon or consider donating at funkinstuff.net. Thank you so much for your interest and support. Enjoy. Hey, before we get started with today's show, I just want to draw your attention to new merchandise. Funkin' Stuff and Truth and Rhythm designs are in, and they look pretty darn cool. So show your support, help support the program, and show off some stylish merchandise and apparel. Only at the Funkin' Stuff store. And you worked, you got to work with Sheila E. a bit too? Yeah, I did She Lee's, for, uh, not her first record, her second record, which is called Sheila E. And I thought she was fantastic. I mean, she, I think she cared too much about imitating Prince and not enough about getting her own sound together. I thought she should have done that. She could have escalated it further, but she was too hung up on the Prince sound. Well, I always wonder how much was that uh, her and how much was it Prince? Oh, I think it was mostly her. Hmm. I mean, he wrote a couple songs like Cuckoo and a couple things, but, you know, she could have taken that and moved with it. I, f I, saw, I first saw her back in like the late 70s with George Duke. You know, and she was completely different. Then when I saw her transformation with Prince, it was such a kick. Yeah. Yeah, she she had a good stepping board there. And she could, she's really talented. She hit the drums harder than anybody I've ever seen. In high heels. That's an aggressive girl. Yeah. I'm glad she's still at it, still doing it. Yeah. Um, well, before I want to talk about your other projects too, but before moving away from Prince, um, what what was um, maybe one or two of the most um, impressive uh, things you ever saw him do? Uh, I've seen a lot of impressive things. Just the fact that he could pick up a, an instrument and break into something that was classic. I mean. It's amazing. He could he could sit down at the piano and play something. You'd go, that that's going to be a hit. It's just he he just had that knack. He just had that chordal knowledge to to get right into it. One time I came into Paisley Park and um, he was in the sound stage, was completely empty. It's like ten thousand square foot sound stage, and. Uh, he had his guitar playing through a amp. He was cranked up, and he was doing blues solos all day long. And you could hear it from everywhere because it was louder than hell. And uh, I thought that was just such a cool thing to do. He he, he had he was he was a blues player really. I mean he. I think he put out a blues record once, but uh, you know as far as the you know, blues solos, he was the best. I mean, look at the, when he played with Tom Petty and Eric Clapton and, and George Harrison, and he outshone them all. He burned them all. They, somebody said to Eric Clapton, what's, what's, it, 
what's it like to be the best blues player in the world? He goes, I don't know, ask Prince. So, I mean, everyone knew that. He was, he was above and beyond. It's all he ever did was play and practice and play and practice and play and practice. Nothing else. Well, as someone who saw him so early on, David, you know, I always thought, I thought that his guitar playing actually improved after he became well-known even, you know, and I've never seen a professional musician who's so well known continue to up their game. Yeah. Well, practice makes perfect. And that was his theory. And, uh, you know, my brother was in this band and he said they practice every single fucking day for a year, every day. And they even had sectionals. They had keyboards one day and guitars the next day. And, rhythm section the next day. I mean, it was very disciplined. But I don't think Bobby was very good when he first started, and he rehearsed himself to death. I mean, Prince made them all rehearse all the time. So it was uh, constant practice. That's, that's what it takes. I mean, besides being a visionary, takes constant practice to be an executionist. Maybe you'll find this amusing or maybe you've heard it before, but you know, when I would see your name on all those records, I, I had to question, is that another Prince pseudonym, David Z? You know, because he had <laughs> Jamie people, Starr and all those things. And I, I know sure. uh, people have mistaken me for that. Yes. They didn't think I was real. <laughs> yeah. Of course, I stayed in the background. I really didn't clamor to the fame. So it's easy to think that. Well, where does his credit and creation of the Minneapolis sound uh, begin and end? And where is your part of that? Uh, I don't know how to define that. I mean, I, I was there from the beginning and we worked together and, uh, you know, sometimes, I mean, he gave me credit where credit is due, sometimes not, but, you know, like on Kiss, I was supposed to be the co-producer, but he made up for it. We, uh, you know, he put me on a lot of other projects, but as far as it, who did what, it's it's a confused mess because uh, you know I I lend a hand on a lot of different things and he, he had a funny habit of giving people credit where they didn't even you do anything I don't know why he did that but he would do that with people and uh, un, it was it, the opposite of what you'd think he gave people credit when they had nothing to do with the record. He didn't do that to me, but he did that to other people. And um, he just had a, a funny way of doing that. I think, I think he loved to confuse people, you know, with all his pseudonyms and, uh, you know, his nicknames and all that. Yeah, it's hard to, it's hard to tell. I think he loved he liked making people try to figure out what was what. Yeah, he definitely liked keeping people off balance. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think he did the same thing with his will. He didn't leave a will, so everybody would be fighting and fighting, and he's probably laughing. He's probably up there laughing at everybody. You know, unless unless one of his lawyers tore up the will, but. It, you know, he uh, he knew it was going to make everybody crazy because he didn't like anybody in his family anyway. <laughs> but it's he, none of them. I've never met any of them except Taika, because I, I, I did Taika's record. But I, I, so the other relatives, I never knew his brothers and sisters. Never met them. They were never there. So I think he just felt like. You know, they deserve to fight with each other, <laughs> I suppose. That kind of makes some sense, but it just seems so um, 
counter to him wanting to con- have his master's ownership and all that and and have such control over what he did yeah you wouldn't think he'd leave it up to the gods yeah and you know that that's a funny part of the puzzle that i don't know you know like you can with those kind of money with millions of dollars like that you can't be too suspicious of the people involved because somebody did something i have my suspicions but yeah um do you feel that there's a lot of stuff that you had a hand in that stole in the vault a lot of stuff that i had a hand in that what that is still in the vault yeah oh yeah i'm sure yeah yeah we did we used to do when i worked with prince directly he'd do two songs a day in the morning we do one song start at the beginning do the drums do the bass finish it do the vocals mix it put it away and then after afternoon we do the same thing and we did that for a long time and a lot of those songs i'd go man that's our that's great that's a hit you gotta put that out and he'd say something like that's what they want me to do i'm not going to do it he, that's what they expect of me i'm not going to do it so he was he was like that he that he always second guessed himself and whatever you thought he was going to do he he didn't do and wherever you thought he was going to show up he wouldn't show up but when you didn't think he was going to be there there he was um so what was the last thing that you worked on uh with him or related to him uh i think it was diamonds and pearls well the last thing i did was i did the the remixes for the 1999 extended deluxe um and i did actually a great remix of uh the original purple rain concert that's on if going to be a film on netflix it's probably not going to come out till next year but we mixed uh for film and they had great i didn't realize it but they had camera on the whole the whole concert i didn't even know they did that but prince filmed everything so this isn't the syracuse one that was released in like 85 on vhs it is but it's a it's a totally professional mix that was my monitor mix from the truck mm. and it was okay but this is in a, i remixed that sunset sound so it's and i think i'm gonna try and do a dolby atmos version of it because that makes more sense at this point well we look yeah. forward to that that'll be yeah. great yeah netflix can do dolby atmos now so I've been talking to Nico Bolas about it, trying to help me out and do it. So two two questions, David. So Diamonds and Pearls was the last um, project that you were around for. Why, why did you no longer work in that circle? I moved away. I moved away. I start... Uh, <clears throat> I did Big Head Todd and the Monsters record that was pretty big. And then after that, I got requests to, for all kinds of companies and people to do the same thing. They wanted their record like that. And after about two or three albums, I went, this is the same shit I've been doing. I did the original, you know, I, I, I want to do something new. So I got, I wanted to do something real. And I dove back into the blues, which is real. And uh, I got involved with uh, Johnny Lang, discovered him in Fargo, North Dakota. And uh, that started my avenue on the blues. And I um, actually, at first I got involved with a group called, a guy named Paul Black out of Wisconsin. Fantastic slide guitar player. Bluesiest guy ever. And I, I took uh, his tape down to 
a blues convention in Memphis, and I ran smack into uh, Isaac Tigrett and Gary Belts, who were just starting the House of Blues, and they they had the clubs, and now they wanted to do a label for for the blues, and they hired me. And they went, why don't you come down and join us? So uh, I remember that. Now. I had forgotten, but I remember that now. Yeah, yeah, that's what I did, and I. I've actually done a lot of good blues records since then. Buddy Guy, Etta James, and won two Grammys for Etta James. Um, and did a lot of, I still, I'm, I just did this uh, Mike Zito record that's been number one on the rock blues charts for four weeks. So I'm still doing that. I love those records too, David. I just saw Mike Zito, uh, couple months ago he played here in charlotte with uh, eric gales and uh anna popovich yeah great show yeah yeah they're great i mean it's a good market to be in because it doesn't doesn't it's not trendy you know it doesn't come or go with what's popular like a rock music business but uh it's a steady stream of people when, when you got into it too, I think in the early nineties was an interesting time because it was sort of like this next generation of players like Kenny Wayne Shepherd and Johnny Lang and Eric Gales, who were all sort of coming out of the ashes of Stevie Ray, no longer yeah. being around. Well, I did records on all three of those guys. I did the Gales brothers. I did Kenny Wayne Shepherd's first record and I discovered Johnny Lang did his first record. So yeah, I think I'm part of helping that new generation of blues that's awesome um and johnny lang too a tremendous singer um besides being a great player um and um what what's your approach with the blues guys versus you know the dance records how do you approach it differently well usually it's not a drum machine which the dance records are that makes a big difference uh the blues records usually do the whole band at once and it's more of a live in the studio situation um that's how we i've done most of it besides it's more fun that way they have the artist stand in there with the band and sing along and shout and yeah what was part of it because you you got a little um, disenchanted with uh, sort of how the music business was going and that it was sort of becoming so production dominated and not so much musical maybe? Yeah, a lot of that too. And, and like I said, after I got presented with the third Big Ed Todd and the Monsters imitation, um, they, you know, it was all a pattern after, we want that, we want that, we want that sound, and, and uh, we want that artist, and, you know, it's limited record company attitude was, they only want what's selling, and um, I've always been against that, much, you know, much to my credit and much to my demise, whatever, but, you know, do you think being with Prince um, gave you a little more feeling of the courage of maybe to, to do something like that, that was more for your, your heart yeah. and soul? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. We, you know, when Prince and I talked a lot about him, what we did, what made us is what was making us happy. Not everybody else. No, he didn't do it for everybody. The only song he ever told me that he did was uh, little red Corvette. He said he wrote that, so he could get on the radio, but he didn't think he didn't like it. Which I went, what? That's really crazy. And he went, I I knew that was going to get on the radio, so that's why I wrote that song. And that's the only time he ever, you know, said he was going to cater to catering to the radio. I felt that way though with diamonds and pearls though too like he felt like maybe he needed another pop hit so he did the diamonds and pearls but um 
I felt like he could, he was so great that he could kind of do that if he wanted to, you know? Yeah. But then he could do something like Kiss, which was totally against the grain. And, you know, piss off the record company. So you mentioned it, and I want to jump back and give it full due, uh, the Fine Young Cannibals, David. Uh, how did you uh, become involved with that project? Um, tell us a little bit about that. Uh, I actually was in L.A. And was it Roger Ailes? The head of London Records. He uh, He wanted to take me out to lunch, and I thought that was cool. And took me out to lunch. He said, I got this group. They, uh, they can't, they all live in outside of London and they can't seem to get together. And went, that's odd. They're in the same city. He goes, well, they're having trouble getting together to finish their recording. He goes, what if we, can't we just ship them to Paisley Park and, uh, they'll be trapped there and you could finish the record. And went, well, it sounds like a theory, I guess. Um, and so they started sending me tapes and uh, they sent me a, a song called She's My Baby, and which, out, which turned out to be She Drives Me Crazy. It was the same song and I thought it was great. Um, and so they got shipped up to Minneapolis and they got off the plane and they had Roland, the lead singer, brought a big bag of uh, brown rice with him because he didn't think we had brown rice in Minneapolis. I mean, they were in culture shock. They were, they didn't know where they were. They were from post-punk London with short hair and you know how they dressed. And uh, Minneapolis was just full of different people for them. They, everyone was tall, everyone was Norwegian or Swedish and they were in shock. And uh, they came in and, you know, sure enough, they had nothing to do but record because there was nothing to do. They're in Minneapolis. So uh, we finished the record there. Um, and as it turns out, the uh, She Drives Me Crazy uh, was the first release. And it turned out to be great for them. Were you surprised at how big of a hit it turned out to be? Yeah, I'm always surprised. I never think it's going to happen like that. You, you know, you don't plan on things like that. Like I say, we just do what makes us happy. And uh, that's what we did. We were happy. So uh, everybody else obviously was too. And turn out to be such a, a MTV darling also, you know, I mean, such heavy video rotation. Yeah, it was good timing for that. Good timing. That was, you know, they took advantage of the whole, I mean, Prince took advantage of MTV in the very beginning too, with uh, When Doves Cry. Did, was... did, did Prince cross paths with the Fine Young Cannibal guys at all or? I don't think he was around. I mean, if he was, it wasn't, he never came in and said hi. It was just, you know, a wave in the hallway. But no, I don't think they ever hung together. They were actually vegetarians at the time. And um, I remember the last day of recording, all the crew kept bugging us because they had a barbecue off outside of the sound stage. They went, you want us to cook you steak? And uh, the cannibals kept saying, no, we're, we're vegetarian. And the last day, Roland goes, I want a steak. And so they cooked him a steak, and then he was eating. <coughs> All the road crew went, the main cannibals eating meat. What are we going to do? Yeah, it was pretty fun. We That's had a ironic with their name, yeah, being vegetarians for sure. Yeah. <laughs> We had a good time. And were you, uh, you were around Paisley Park when uh, Mavis Staples and George Clinton were around? Yeah. Too? Yeah. Yeah, I was there. 
George Clinton used to. <laughs> he, I guess you can tell that now, but he, he was in Studio A and I was in Studio B with an amateur group that, you know, newbies. And George Clinton kept calling me on the phone going, Hey man, you got any pot? I need I need to have a hit and mellow me out. I went, yeah, I, I'm in a take. Can I wait till the take's over? And he went, yes, cool, cool. And he called again, and then I said, the take's not over. Then five seconds later, he walks in the studio. And the group was, you know, they were in there as amateurs, and they, they saw him, and they just stopped playing. They stopped playing and they went up uh. <laughs> and he uh, he came in and kidnapped me made me give him a joint I'm not admitting to anything but hey, you know what um, it's legal I, now yeah I, I had him over my house in uh, California in 1989 right around the time when he was working with Prince in Paisley Park and uh, he was inside my house, not more than five minutes. I looked away, I looked back, and he was rolling on my cocktail table, a joint, so. <laughs> oh, he was rolling a joint. Oh. A joint, yeah, 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 so. Yeah, that's him. <laughs> did, did you work on his first record, on his record at all, or? George, no. Oh. No, that was, I don't know, they, <laughs> I used to walk into the studio and he'd be sitting telling a story and all the musicians would be around and uh, he'd be telling this story and telling this story and I went, okay, I gotta go back to work. I went back to work and then I came back in after the take was over and he was still talking. I went, do you guys ever push a red button in here? <laughs> they just He just liked to tell stories. That was his way of recording. Did, did you uh, have any other sizable hits uh, come out of uh, Paisley Park that were not Prince projects? Uh, yeah, the song that Nena Cherry did for uh, You Got Me Under My Skin, it was on the Red Hot and Blue record. That came out, uh, it was a pretty big international hit. Uh, I did AHA, the group, they were huge. Uh, Talk about we, video, yeah. Yeah, Memorial Beach. Um, <clears throat> during the time I traveled to uh, uh, Germany, I mean, where was it? Sweden, no, yeah, it was Sweden, to work with the Sisters of Mercy. That was, uh, that was cool. I got to work with Andrew Eldridge, who was, I thought, I thought he was a really, uh, a great genre that, needed to be exposed. And I knew the new uh, uh, Vampire Lestat movie was coming out. And my goal was to get Sisters of Mercy on the Vampire Lestat movie, the, the soundtrack. And uh, unfortunately, they had a fight with uh, Bob Krasnow, who was head of Blue Thumb label, and he made it his life goal to not to see the Sisters of Mercy did not succeed in America, which was really terrible. It was some sort of a political fight, and um, he blocked their career. And everybody in Europe and around the world loved that group. They were huge, gigantic. And um, I thought maybe that would be a possibility for me to get them forward and do the soundtrack, but they didn't. It was unfortunate. It like harkens back to what you were talking about earlier. I'm not even sure we were on the air then, but you know about uh, the business. You know. Yeah. Right. It's uh, it's not just music, which sucked. If it was, it would be different. But you got to play the game. Yeah. So when you uh, worked with so-called alternative acts, it would be on alternative rock stations mostly, but you know, your Go-Go's and Bananaramas and um, things that probably came out of the Fine Young Cannibal success, I'm guessing, Bodines and 
How did you approach that kind of material differently from the funkier Prince type stuff? Well, like I said, the main thing was there was no drum machines. Uh, that was a different style of music. It was drummer, live bass. It wasn't electronic instruments uh, to set the pace. And basically the drum machine was the big difference because that could afford you to do sparser beats and uh, there was no cymbals involved. And uh, it was it's a whole different kind of music. And I did the Bodine's record and that came out, that was great, but I'm sorry if I'm not mentioning somebody, but uh, there's been a lot of them. But yeah, that's the main difference. I mean, dance music needed a steady beat, usually a drum machine. Uh, I mean, with Funky Town, it was way before drum machines. We made a drum machine by having a, Steve Greenberg was the artist, he went out there and played the kick drum with a click track until we had four exactly on. And then I cut it into a loop <clears throat> and made a kick drum loop. And then we did the same thing with a snare drum. So they were all the same. Is, is there any um, producer or engineers that you kind of looked up to that you uh, were influenced by? Yeah. Yeah, of course. There's a... Uh, all different styles. I mean, <clears throat> Roy Thomas Baker, who was a, did a lot of the the cars and stuff like that, and multi-million voices on that the whole style. Um, people like uh, Nico Bolas, who I think is fantastic, great ear. Um, I've learned a lot from him. Uh, George Massenburg, was, I had the good fortune of making friends with in Nashville. He was, I just had him on a couple of weeks ago. Oh, yeah. Great guy. Genius. And he's a rule breaker. I mean, even though he manufactures equipment, he, he doesn't go, he doesn't go by the rules. Uh, those are some of the immediate influences. Mm -hmm. Anybody that does anything different, I like. What do you do differently working with uh, a full band versus a, a solo artist? Is there a different approach? Uh, well, with a full band, um, there's miking techniques that are different. With a solo artist, you can concentrate on one instrument at a time. I've done it both ways. It's hard to say what's better. It's, nothing's better. It's different. One instrument at a time is different than four or five people playing at once. You can take a lot more liberties with one instrument at a time because you got a whole room that you can put mics in and not pick up any leakage. But then if you're with a band, there's a certain way to pick up leakage that makes it sound great. Like, uh, like I mean, for example, uh, the recording of Purple Rain was a live on stage recording at First Avenue and all the mics were hot. All the vocal mics, the audience mics I had, the room mics, the drum mics, the overhead mics, they all picked up everything. So it gave it this live pulsing feeling. And I don't think, I think there's something to that that's great. It's not just one mic and one instrument. It's everything. And you got to learn how to combine all those things so they make sense. And I like to try and mix in 3D, which uh, is actually easier when you have so many mics going. The Etta James records were like that too. They, There was more of her voice in the bass mic than there was in her voice mic. But 
it sounded a certain way and that's the way you know it's exciting it must have been really exciting to be that close to an instrument like hers i mean what a talent oh yeah she's great she was great i thought her records were terrific she was funny as hell too the first time i got a involved with her was uh, my friends at RCA in New York. <clears throat> Patrick Clifford, he said, uh, I want you to work with Etta James. And I went, wow, that's great. I, I was just starting my blues era, my blue period. And um, I was really excited and I was <clears throat> waiting for her to call. And sure enough, I get a call at seven o'clock at night. I was in Nashville and I pick up the phone. She goes, this is David Z? And I went, yeah. She goes, this is Etta James. I went, oh, wow, okay. She goes, we don't need no motherfucking producer. I went, what? She goes, we don't need no motherfucking producer. We don't want to sound like Prince. I went, well, uh, I was just trying to help. I mean, <laughs> they thought I could help you and she went, <laughs> Right off the bat, it was on, you know, she started it. And uh, it calmed down from there. But that was my first conversation with her. <laughs> wow. Yeah. You made it through the initiation, it sounds like. I guess so. Yeah. I know I'm jumping around a little bit, but you've had such a diverse uh, and and multifaceted career. Um, you worked with Jody Watley some too. Yeah, I did her uh, first album. I'm looking for a new love, and yeah, that was great. She was a workhorse. She did not get frustrated. She said, "I mean, I that was during the age of tape, and I we had to punch in a lot of words because you know I, mean, I made sure she was on pitch." We didn't have auto tuner or anything, so we had to punch in every word that was off key, and that's hard to do. And different endings for each phrases, that's hard to do too. And um, she worked and worked and worked and never complained, never got tired. She just did it. And uh, Andre Simone wrote that with her all that all those songs that we did, and it was fun. It was just me and Andre and, and Jody. He, Andre had everything programmed, so he'd push a button and all the synthesizers would do everything. You know, they were all pre-programmed, the bass, the keyboard, we all did mic them separate, but it was a, it was a challenge, it was cool. And Jody was great. I think she got the Grammy that year, for best vocal performance. Yeah, well, it was a monster record. I mean, that just shot her to the moon. That was like, yeah. you know, Janet Jackson, similar to the Janet Jackson. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it was great. Good videos. She was a very sexy girl. Had a certain sound to her voice that no one else had. Do you, you feel like Andre Simone is a bit of an unsung guy? Yeah, he's an unsung hero. He was very talented, very talented. I saw him play at the Mint the other night last month, and um, he was great. You know, I think, unfortunately, he his time just went by, and he never made more of it than the Jody Watley record, which is unfortunate because he was at the top of his game there. But, like I say, it's got a cross social. The social part and the music part has to come together somehow. I don't know. And there's a, there's a lot of people that were revolving around Prince that <clears throat> he kind of overshadowed. And um, now on one hand, he was always made, he was always mad that people used his name to get ahead. Uh, but on the other hand, he overshadowed a lot of people that could have gone further, like Sheila, like Andre, that Jesse, that, you know, if he wasn't there, they would have stuck out more. But 
works both ways. Absolutely. Yeah. It just seems so like there's a little bit of idiosyncratic uh, personalities there too, like Andre and Jesse. And, you know, they're kind of like want to cut their own path, you know? Yeah. Whether that's good for them or not. I mean, they might, they may, <clears throat> may have turned further away from where they should have been. But that's not for me to say. I don't know. As you worked with uh, Government Mule also, I love those guys. Yeah, that was great. Yeah, I did uh, on the Deep End, the first Deep End record. Did three songs on there and with different bass players. We did uh, one song with uh, Flea from the Red Hot Chili Peppers. The other one with uh, is the guy that played with Prince, Larry Graham. Uh, and then another one we had, uh, <clears throat> the rhythm guitar player for, uh, who's Lane Staley with Allison Chains. Yeah. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. uh, Cantrell, Jerry yeah. Cantrell. Jerry Cantrell. Yeah. He sang harmony on one of them. But we traveled all over to do that. We did it in L.A., we did it in San Francisco, and then I mixed it back in L.A. And that was after their bass player had passed on and they had yeah. guys step in for a tribute, yeah. Yeah, they had 20 different bass players for 20 different songs. Yeah, Warren is uh, amazing. What an amazing guy. That voice, the guitar very very talented person yeah there's a guy under the radar for most people but yeah great talent yeah yeah he's he's a uh, once in a million and um yeah he's at home in like almost any kind of genre too you know yeah um and buddy guy was he a character buddy guy was a real character yeah uh we did the tracking in Nashville, and um, Buddy was great. And uh, we, I took him in all different directions. It did drums, drum loops, and I mean, he was in for it. It was I know it was a different record because it didn't wasn't just the playing songs and playing drums and bass. It was we did rhythmic loops and all kinds of shit going on in there, and uh, I thought it was a real different record. I liked it. And when it came time to vocals, Buddy said, uh, <clears throat> you know, um, I'm not so confident with my vocals. And I'm thinking, what? This guy's fucking... He goes, I'm not so confident. I may, I may need to have you get a little uh, cognac. I went, cognac? What's cognac? <laughs> he meant cognac. He goes, yeah, I gotta have some cognac so I can sing. And I called the record company, and, and the a and guy said, he only drinks $150 a bottle of stuff. So you prepared to do that? I went, yeah, I guess, I have to. <laughs> but he was hysterical. He, he, was, uh, he was really a classic to work with. I can only imagine. Um, and still doing it, you know, he's still got the, the chops and the singing just yeah, incredible. Yeah, we did. And we did a duet with Johnny Lang. It came out good. And you've been working with, uh, the, the Allman, uh, offspring too, right? With Devin Allman. Yeah. Yeah. We did, I did, uh, Southern gospel, Cyril Neville, Mike Zito. Devin Allman, that was a great group. Very diverse. And Albert Cummings is another guy that I think maybe a lot of people don't know, but he's a heck of a player too. Albert Cummings is good. Yeah. Uh, he came to LA and we recorded here. And- um, Is he Australian? 
What? Is he Australian? Where's he from? Albert Cummings. He's from like Indiana or something. I, oh, some... he's from America. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, he's he's like a contractor. He has another job. He builds houses. That's what these a lot of these guys have got to do it. Some of the best players are building houses. <laughs> yeah, well, the music business is nothing you can rely on anymore. Yeah, it's a damn shame. Chris Duarte is another great player, too. Chris Duarte is great. He's gotten a lot more successful since I worked with him. I don't even remember. That was so long ago. So when uh, five years ago now, it's incredible to believe, but uh, when Prince uh, passed away, um, what was the last time you had communicated with him at all? I, uh, I was up there. <clears throat> He wanted to get his, he said his board was broken in Studio A. And it was just filthy dirty. Whenever you touched a button, it would go. <laughs> and um, I went up there to try and help. I brought a technician with me and we started taking apart the board. And uh, he wasn't around. And then one night I walked out of the studio and he was walking in the entryway. And he looked at me and he hugged me and he went, wow, it's been a long time. I went, yeah, long time. And I said, it was, it's good to see you. He goes, likewise. And that was the last time I talked to him. What year about was that? What year was that? I think it was a year before he died. Oh. Hmm. Yeah. 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 Were you as shocked as uh, most other people were? I was in total shock. I had never, <clears throat> I had never seen him do a drug. I had never seen him even drink. I mean, maybe occasionally, but I was in shock and disbelief that it was an overdose. It, I, I, I said, it can't be. I mean, the, he's been straight his whole life. Never saw him touch a pill. And evidently his, uh, hip replacement surgery was so severe that, and he, he wouldn't do it. He wouldn't do the surgery because Jehovah's Witness wouldn't allow him to get a transfusion, which is what he needed to do to survive the operation and he wouldn't do it. So he was in more and more pain every day. And uh, I never knew him during that period, so I never saw uh, anything that looked like he was going to do that. I mean, I never saw his down period. So, I mean, I'd heard about it. I knew some concert promoters I met in Nashville one night. We had a drink and the concert promoter said, I got to tell you something. We had Prince and um, he's in bad shape. And I went, what? He went, yeah, he, he was taking pills like there was no tomorrow. And I didn't believe him. I mean, I thought it was just a nasty rumor. And then two years later, he, he died. So I was, I denied it. I mean, I denied it to everybody. I said, he can't have done that. That's, he was a straight person. Never seen him get involved. Never saw him do a drug. And there was a, a rule around Paisley Park. You didn't do drugs. That was what the that was what the rule was there. You didn't do that. So it's hard for me to believe. Exception for George Clinton. Well, that was a different yeah. George Clinton could pour put a big rock in a chop it up on the board and he wouldn't say anything, but but that was the only person he let get away with it. I don't even know if he was there. But yeah, I thought I he just seemed almost immortal to me, Prince. You know, I just thought he would outlast us all. That's why it seems so unlikely. Because I thought he was going to live forever. But um, you know, thank goodness he was so prolific while he was here, and then he left of, left us with so much great 
music and yeah. and that you were able to contribute so much to that too. Yeah, Tyka said, I don't know if this is true or not, but she said she talked to him and he said, I've done what I came to do and I don't need to be here anymore. I mean, that sounded like a made up story, but that's what she said, he said. They never really talked anyway, so I can't really imagine that's true. Yeah, if you want to believe it, I guess it can give some closure of some kind. Yeah. Um, yeah, you can want to believe all the conspiracy theories, too. Yeah. I've never been a conspiracist, um, but um, but something doesn't quite seem right about the way that whole thing. I know. Out, so. I know. <clears throat> Especially about the will. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but... For someone interested in, in getting into, you know, sound and audio and engineering um, and doing a little bit of the path that, that you did, uh, what would you recommend to them? Uh, do it your own way. I, <clears throat> I don't know what else to say. I mean, it's nice to be educated in equipment and how things work. But a lot of times I contribute my success to not knowing how things work and doing it my own way. I mean, I learned a lot by myself, but uh, I never had the instruction of someone who knew what they were doing, which I think helps because it helped me. And I would, I would turn knobs I didn't know what they were. And uh, I had, I've had engineers go, you can't do that. I went, well, I did it. I mean, I don't know. Uh, your own path is the only thing I can say. Uh, I mean, you have to know basics, but um, I, I had the good fortune of being a musician, too. So I learned engineering after I was a musician. And so I got to experiment, you know, I got to express myself on an instrument called the studio. That was my instrument, and uh, I played it, and I still do, and that that's kind of the difference. You know, my, if I make mistakes, I make mistakes, but that's where that's how I did it. How, how was it going back to uh, you know work on like that uh, deluxe uh, nineteen ninety nine and that was back. fun. That was, was really, yeah. I was wondering if it was a little bit bittersweet because there may be some sadness, but also glad to do it, you know? The only sadness was he was gone, yeah. but it, I wouldn't have even worked on it if he wasn't. So that was good. And I got to, uh, I got to work with some of the people again. Wendy and Lisa came in and helped out. Gave, and uh, gave background vocals and Lisa played a part that was missing on the tape. And uh, it was great to go back. And I mean, I know how that band's supposed to sound, so it was fun. There's no surprises. It's yeah. a tremendous set. I mean, really enjoyed it. Um, the uh, extra track, I mean, I'm always, excited to hear you know stuff that hadn't been released before so yeah well i'm sure there'll be some stuff from the vault coming out and um i can't wait for this netflix film to come out because that concert is what's that night is what started everything that was the big night that prince recorded that started his whole career Basically, I mean, it, it, that was the Purple Rain concert. And uh, the movie is just the, them lip syncing to what we did. This is the real concert. So is this the one you were talking about that was the first performance with uh, Wendy and, and that, or is it the one? It's the first performance with Randy, Wendy, yeah. Okay, so where they actually recorded Purple Rain. That's coming out as a movie. 
yeah, the uh, the songs from that concert that I recorded that wound up on the record was Purple Rain, I Would Die For You, Baby I'm A Star. There was a bootleg of uh, the monitor mix from that show too, but it wasn't, uh, wasn't a great mix and it wasn't a great camera. I mean, it, they've redone everything. Uh, they took the camera shots and the recording and redid every, remixed everything, color corrected it all. I mean, I'm hoping that they, you know, end up remixing and redoing all of those albums and videos. And I mean, they could enhance them so much. Yeah. Well, I know this one is, so we'll see. And mm -hmm. I'm excited to do it in surround too, because that should be huge. Well, what else are you uh, working on? Anything else? Like I said, I just got done with Mike Zito. He's been, he's been hitting the charts pretty hard for Americana. He won the Blues Artist of the Year or something, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm actually fishing around right now for new projects. So if you got anything, let me know. Well, I was so glad that we're getting back to some live performing that concert I mentioned with Mike Zito and Eric Gales was the first one I had gone to since February of 2020. Yeah. Yeah. Live music has really suffered. And that indirectly suffers me because if you can't play live, you don't want to make a record because what's the point if you can't promote it? So that's been uh, holding everybody back. That's like a catch-22 for you. Yeah, it doesn't do me very well. I mean, I luckily have been getting around it, but... Uh, Is there anyone uh, that you'd hope to work with uh, before it's said and done for you who might be a sort of a dream? I don't know. There's a bunch of new artists I'd love to do, but I think they're self-contained. I've been following... Uh, there's a new girl named Maddie Noise. It's sort of progressive music, but uh, very soulful. She's 17, um, good singer. And her, her last name is Noise, N-O-Y-S-E. Okay, put that together. That's like having a name like Prince, like Noise. That's good. Then there's another one, uh, Tate McRae out of Canada. Fantastic voice, fantastic singer. Um, there's some new artists that I really am into. How do they come onto your radar usually? I dig. I dig and dig. I always have. I always try to spot new things. I'm always looking for new things. Thank you for this. Oh, it's been great. I really appreciate it. Thanks. Okay. So thank you. Take good care, David. Good to yes, talk God. to you. Okay. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Truth and Rhythm. A big thank you goes out to our guest as well as to you, the viewer and listener. Also, much gratitude to Pleasure for supplying the show's funky opening and closing music. As a reminder, you can always access the complete list of linked shows by episode at funkinstuff.net. I urge you to support this program and receive the extra benefits along with that by subscribing to the Funk and Stuff channel on YouTube and sharing it with funk, R&B, and jazz lovers, joining Truth and Rhythm's membership program at Patreon, submitting a donation at funkandstuff.net, buying Everything is on the One, the first guide to funk book at Amazon, shopping at the Funky Things store for cool merchandise at funkandstuff.net, and linking through funkandstuff.net for all of your Amazon purchases. In addition, if you're an artist or anyone seeking proven, results-oriented, professional marketing, PR, writing, or editing consultation or production, check out the media services section at funkinstuff.net. Also, I encourage you to drop me a line at scottg at funkinstuff.net. I love the feedback, suggestions, guest requests, appearance and sponsorship inquiries, and just talking about my favorite subject, groove-based music. For now, and as always, this is Scott Dr. GX Wolfine saying, keep on keep vibing, on vibing to the rhythm of the one.